Welcome back to Brain Ablaze, a weekly podcast about epilepsy, by epileptics, for epileptics, and their caretakers. I'm your host, David Clifford. Thanks for tuning in today. I really appreciate it. One can't talk about epilepsy without first talking about seizures. In this episode, we will begin the process of covering the different categories of seizures. If you're new to the Brain Blaze podcast, I just want to say that I'm not a medical expert. I'm just someone that has struggled with the ins and outs of epilepsy for almost three decades. My hope is that the podcast can provide insights that listeners just cannot get through existing support structures. In the first episode, I stated, By definition, epilepsy is a generic diagnosis given to patients who have had at least two seizures within a defined time span. Absolutely anyone can have a seizure. In fact, one out of ten people living in the United States will have a seizure in their lifetime. So, what are the basic causes of seizures? Well, immune system abnormalities, trauma, genetics, brain structure abnormalities, stroke, tumors, infectious disease. And here's the kicker. In some cases, we just don't know. The human brain is so complicated that medical experts just haven't figured out how some of it works. There are over 30 classifications of seizures, not to mention the series of disorders and diseases with symptoms that mimic that of seizures. It is far too much to cover in one episode. Instead, this is the first of many on Brain Ablaze to tackle the problem. This episode covers the basics of high-level categorization of seizures, and we'll get further into the details as more episodes follow. One of the major ways that medical experts classify seizures is how electricity moves through the brain where it starts, how far it spreads, and the area it affects. To really cover this phenomenon, neuroscientists will often cover complex structures like inhibitory neurons, excitatory neurons, GABA neurotransmitters, and the hypersynchronization of the action potential. Don't worry, I'm going to try to simplify this further. We will then come back later and fill out the details. The analogy that I've used in the past is the case of the leaky champagne tower. Wait, give me a chance. If you've never seen one, a champagne tower is a growing trend in wedding receptions as a wow factor is an immediate Instagram-ready experience. Hundreds of champagne glasses are positioned in a pyramid. As the champagne is poured into the glass at the very, very tip-top level, the champagne quickly cascades down to the next level of glasses. Champagne cascades to the next level, then to the next level, then to the next level, and you get the point. Most of the time, the champagne towel works perfectly, but what happens when it doesn't? In the case where there is a single champagne glass causing a leak in the tower, only the glasses below are affected. If this were to happen in the brain, healthcare professionals would call this a focal onset seizure. It is localized to one or more spots in one half of the brain. Subsequently, the electrical storm only affects the area around the focus. Depending on the focus location, it might affect a number of motor or sensory skills. A spectator might witness that the person having a focal seizure starts repeating actions like swallowing, smacking of their lips, blinking, twitching, scratching, chewing, or clenching and unclenching of their jaw. In some cases, the leak in the champagne tower is so great that it causes the whole champagne tower to collapse. If this were to happen in the brain, healthcare providers will call this a generalized onset seizure. In the brain, the electricity moves to encompass both sides of the brain, affecting Well, everything. A person might lose consciousness and experience severe muscle contractions. The grand marshal of generalized onset seizures is a tonic-clonic seizure. 
People your grandparents' age called this type a grand mal seizure, but that term is very antiquated now. When most people think of a seizure, they actually imagine a generalized onset tonic-clonic seizure. You know, the person falls, maybe they even scream or flex their muscles, then they convulse. In our next episode, we will cover further classification of generalized onset seizures, and we'll show that not all of them have the same symptoms. Although medical professionals provide distinct classifications of seizures, some of us exhibit symptoms from a grab bag of these classifications. For example, one might experience generalized onset seizures brought on by a series of focal events. Doctors would call this secondary generalized seizures. Each person's experience when having a seizure is often completely unique. Continuing to use the metaphor of the champagne tower, just imagine the complexity of the problem that your neurologist faces. Tiny random offsets in the placement of the glasses and the differences in the glasses when they are manufactured makes each tower absolutely unique. Once the tower is created, one can't expect each of the hundreds of glasses to determine where the leak occurs. The only way to learn more about the leak and how it spreads is to keep the champagne flowing, which of course causes more mess. To measure electricity in a patient's brain, doctors use a an electrocephal an electrocephal an electrocephal an EEG. Oh son of a bit son of a bit son of a bit 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 a gun. By connecting electrodes to the scalp, one can measure electricity in the brain. Using this data, an expert can determine where a seizure starts in and even track how it moves through the brain. Of course, to do this, the patient must have a seizure while connected to the EEG. The seemingly random incidence of seizures makes this process of capturing a bit difficult. Unfortunately, even extended EEGs provide false negatives sometimes. Without a way to measure your brain, a doctor is stuck with only second-hand data. This is why it's so important that a person experiencing the seizure provide as much information as possible to the neurologist when trying to diagnose the problem. What one feels in the moments just before the seizure can be as important as what witnesses see. Here are some tips that I've found useful to get this information to the doctor. As soon as you can, immediately following the seizure, write down what happened. I can't tell you how many times I've walked into an appointment with my doctor, only to completely choke and forget everything. This goes double for spectators. I know this may be a bit embarrassing, but we're talking about your health here. Ask them what happened. Did they see you behave differently before the actual event? In the time of smartphones, they may have already videoed it. Of course, this is actually a good time to ask them not to post any videos that they did take to social media. In my opinion, when it comes down to it, more information is good information. Hopefully it will help you and your neurologist track down the problem. At some point though, your neurologist might turn around and say, some of this information is not good or not useful. And you have to take that in consideration. Your neurologist wants to make sure that you're using your time wisely and not stressing or even overstressing when it comes to your seizures. As a special gift, visit our website at brainablaze.com to see the cringiest video of a champagne tower collapse we could find. If you like today's show, subscribe and stick around. And help us by giving us a five-star rating on iTunes or wherever you download your content. One small click really does help. See you next time.